Father in heaven, we come before your throne with humility, but at the same time, we come with boldness because we come in the name of Jesus. We know that Jesus stands before you representing us, and you look at us in him. We thank you that we are accepted in the beloved. We ask that as we open your holy word, help us, Lord, to handle it with reverence. Help us to rightly divide the word of truth. Inspire us. Fill us with your spirit. Open our minds to understand and our hearts to receive and empower us to proclaim your message boldly and without fear. We pray in the most holy name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> the Gospels mention two miraculous fishing expeditions. One of them at the beginning of Christ's ministry and the other one a reaffirmation at the end of his ministry. We also have among the parables of Jesus the parable of the dragnet which is found in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 47 through 50. I want to read that passage and then we are going to interpret the symbols involved in fishing. Now we're not talking about hook fishing, line and hook fishing. We're talking about net fishing, which is the fishing that existed in the days of Christ. So let's go to Matthew 13 and read verses 47 through 50. We're going to interpret the symbols and then Towards the end of our study, we're going to take a look at the two miraculous fishing expeditions. Beginning in verse 47 of chapter 13, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind which when it was full, they drew it to shore. And they sat down and gathered the good into vessels and threw away the bad. So, now comes the comparison, so will it be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth separate the wicked from among the just and cast them into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. There are many symbols in this passage, so let's take a look at the symbols. First of all, we have the symbolism of the sea where the fish swim. What does the sea represent? We don't have to guess. In Isaiah chapter 17, verses 12 and 13, we find an explanation of the meaning of the sea. The sea represents humanity as a conglomerate group. It says there in Isaiah 17 and verse 12, Woe to the multitude of many people who make a noise like the roar of the seas. So the seas represent many people. And then it continues saying, and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. So the sea represents the totality of humanity. Now what do the fish that swim in the sea represent. They represent individuals in the sea of humanity. Of course, we all know the text where Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So the fish represent men. And by the way, the word men is used generically. Do you know that in Genesis, Adam and Eve are both called man? in Genesis chapter 5, 
So when we refer to men, we're, we're talking generically about human beings, men and women. I think that we need to make that clear as we begin. Now, I also want to read a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy. There are those who have destroyed in themselves the moral image of God. The gospel net, and we're going to talk about the net in a moment, the gospel net must gather in these poor outcasts. So the fish represent what? The poor outcasts in whom the image of God has been almost destroyed. The statement continues, angels of God will cooperate with those who are engaged in this work, who make every effort to save perishing souls to give them opportunities which many have never heard. So the sea is humanity and the fish are the individuals that are in this world. Now what is represented by the boat? Because there's a boat involved here. What is represented by the boat? The boat represents the church because the net gathers the fish into the boat, just like preaching gathers souls into the church. So the boat represents the church. What is represented by the fishermen? Well, we don't have to guess. Jesus said that he would make us fishers of men. Let me just read a couple of statements from the Spirit of Prophecy on the point of the fishermen. The first statement is in the devotional book that I may know him, chapter 185, and it reads like this. Our Savior did not ignore learning or despise education, yet he chose unlearned fishermen for the work of the gospel because they had not been schooled in the false customs and traditions of the world. They were men of good natural ability and of humble, teachable spirit, men whom he could educate for his great work. So no matter how humble a person is, how untrained, how uneducated, that person is a fisherman. In the other statement, Counsels to Parents and Teachers, page 512, Ellen White wrote that Christ was able to qualify unlearned fishermen to carry out the high commission he would give them. The lessons of truth given these lowly men were of mighty significance. They were to move the world. It seemed but a simple thing for Jesus to connect these humble persons with himself. But it was an event productive of tremendous results. And I love this last part of the quotation. Their words and their works were to revolutionize the world. Wow! God calls fishermen to what? to revolutionize the world. She also said to move the world. In order to do that, there must be power. Now, what does the net represent? The net represents the gospel. It represents the message of the Bible. What does the casting of the net represent? It represents the preaching of the gospel. Notice this statement from Ellen White, um, Christ Object Lessons, page 93. The casting of a net is the preaching of the gospel. This gathers both good and evil into the church. So what does the boat represent? The church. And what does the casting of the net represent? the preaching of the gospel, therefore the net represents the gospel. Now, if we are going to fish, 
we need to learn to use the net. The gospel, the, the disciples were very proficient in fishing because they knew how to use the net. They knew how to catch fish. And so we must learn to use the net. We must learn the message of Scripture. Notice this statement in Councils to Teachers 253 and 254. The Lord wishes you to learn how to use the gospel net. See, it takes education. It takes tact. It takes, it takes care to talk to people about the gospel. So the Lord wishes you to learn how to use the gospel net. Many need to learn this art. So using the net is an art. In order for you to be successful in your work, the meshes of your net, that is of the gospel, the application of the scriptures must be close and the meaning easily discerned. Then make the most of drawing in the net. Come right to the point. Make your illustrations self-evident. However great a man's knowledge, it is of no avail unless he is able to communicate it to others. Let the pathos of your voice, its deep feeling, make its impression on hearts. So we need to learn how to speak with tact and with wisdom. We need to learn how to cast the net. Ellen White also wrote in, uh, in Councils to Teachers 254 and 255 of an event that occurred during her lifetime. Teachers, she's talking to teachers, but I believe that she's talking also to preachers. Teachers, remember that the Lord is your strength. Strive to give the students ideas that will be to them a savor of life unto life. Teach by illustrations. How, do, how are we supposed to cast the net? Teach by what? I see the education director nodding. Yes, absolutely. Praise the Lord. You have a good education director here, folks. Hang on to him, okay? <laughs> now, it continues saying here, teach by illustrations. Ask God to give your words, give you words to speak that all can understand. The purpose of studying the Bible with people is not to show our intelligence. It is to make things clear, understandable by illustrations, learning to use the net. You know, sometimes when I pre finish preaching a sermon, people come and say, wow, you know, I never heard something like that before. How eloquent you were. You know, they... they flower things up. But you know, it's like water off a duck's back, as far as I'm concerned. When people tell me, I got it. I understood. It was clear. That's all I need to hear. Because the purpose of casting the net is clear communication so that people understand. Now Ellen White gives her illustration. A little girl once asked me, are you going to speak this afternoon? No, not this afternoon, I replied. I'm very sorry, she said. I thought you were going to speak. And I asked several of my companions to come. Will you please ask the minister to speak easy words that we can understand? Will you please tell him that we do not understand large words like justification and sanctification? We do not know what these words mean. Make, and then Ellen White gives counsel, make your explanations clear. For I know that there are many who do not understand many of the things said to them. Let the Holy Spirit mold and fashion your speech. For that we need to pray, folks. Once again, speak. Uh, let the Holy Spirit mold and fashion your speech. 
cleansing it from all dross. Speak as little children, remembering that there are many well advanced in years who are but little children in understanding. By earnest prayer and diligent effort, we are to obtain a fitness for speaking. We're to learn to speak. She continues, this fitness includes uttering every syllable clearly, placing the force and emphasis where it belongs. Speak slowly. Many speak rapidly, hurrying one word after another so fast that the effect of what they say is lost. Into what you say, put the spirit and life of Christ. What beautiful counsel on how to learn to use the net. Now the next point is that we need to make sure that the net is not ripped, <laughs> which would mean misinterpreting the gospel, holes in the message that we share. You know, I had the privilege in May of 2001, shortly before uh, the World Trade Center event and the Pentagon event, to travel uh, by, uh, actually by plane over there, and then uh, by car between three countries, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. And when we visited Lebanon, we went to Tyre, and Sidon, and it was early in the morning, and we saw the fishermen there in their boats, and they were mending their nets. Because when you go fishing, you know, sometimes there's a hole in the net, and it needs to be mended. When we proclaim the message, we meet, need to be absolutely sure that there are not holes in our arguments. We need to make sure that our arguments are sound. Ellen White even says that sometimes when we use deficient arguments, we can silence someone, but eventually that will come to haunt us. So we need to make sure that the net is repaired and doesn't have holes. Another point is that we must learn to fish in deep waters. Notice Luke chapter 5 and verses 4 through 6. It says, when he had stopped speaking, when Jesus stopped speaking to the multitude, he said to Simon, launch deep. Let down your nets for a catch. Launch out into the deep. What could that mean? Well, Ellen White once again gives us some light on what it means to launch out into the deep. Signs of the Times, September 4, 1879, she wrote, Ministers to whom is entrusted the most sacred message of warning ever given to the world have confined too much to looking after the few who have embraced the truth. Is that true? Kind of hovering over the church? She continues, when their principal labor should have been for those who have not heard the message. There are those who think it is their duty to preach the truth, but they dare not venture from the shore and they catch no fish. They will choose to go among the churches over and over the same ground. They report a good time, a pleasant visit. But we look in vain for the souls that are converted to the truth through their instrumentality. These ministers hug the shore too closely. Let them launch out into the deep and cast their net where the fish are. Very enlightening statement, I believe. You know, ministers and church members, we are not only to hover over the church and visit the church members, we are to launch out into the deep, into the community, to where the fish are. 
because hovering over the church, the fish are already in the boat. We need to get fish and bring them into the boat. And for that, we need to go to deep waters. Another important point is that we must persevere in fishing. You know, when I was a child, my parents used to go uh, on vacation every year to uh, a place, to an island, beautiful island, the island of Margarita in Venezuela. And uh, at that time, I would go fishing. And sometimes I would go the whole day without fishing. One fish. Kind of discouraging. But you know what I did the next day? I went fishing again. And I was successful in my fishing expedition. Notice what Ellen White wrote. This is manuscript 161, 1904. We are to search for, for and fish souls. Sometimes we will catch fish and sometimes not. However, we are to persevere in God's work, knowing that he has given us a message for unbelievers, a message that will be able to win many hearts. Now you notice that, according to the parable of the dragnet, that the net gathered good and bad fish. Hmm. What do the good fish represent? They represent those who ultimately will be saved. What do the bad fish represent? Those in the church who will be lost. Listen, folks. Let's notice what Ellen White wrote about this. Christ Object Lessons 72 and 73. The world has no right to doubt the truth of Christianity because there are unworthy members in the church. Are there unworthy members in the church? Absolutely. Nor should Christians become disheartened because of these false brethren. He has said that false brethren will be found in the church till the close of time. So if the gospel net, the preaching of the gospel, gathers into the church wheat and tares and gathers into the church good and bad fish, is there a moment in which there needs to be a separation of the good fish from the bad fish? It is called the investigative judgment. Listen carefully now. The pre-advent investigative judgment only deals with people who have professed the name of Jesus Christ. And this parable proves it. Because the only ones that are separated on the shore are the ones that are in the boat, not the ones that are in the sea. Are you following me or not? In other words, the separation of the fish, the, all of the fish are gathered into the boat, and then the boat is brought to the shore, and on the shore, there's a separation of the good fish from the bad fish. There will be a separation from true and counterfeit believers in the church, in the investigative judgment. Let me ask you, in the church, are there wise and foolish virgins? Do the foolish virgins have lamps? Do they profess Christ? Of course they do, but they're counterfeit believers. Was there a separation when the door closed? Absolutely. Let me ask you, are there in the church people who have the wedding garment and those who don't? Absolutely. You remember the parable of the wedding garment in Matthew 22 and verses 1 through 14? You know there was this, this wedding that was going to take place and many, many were invited. And of course, they were given a special garment that was like their pass to enter the wedding. And the king comes out and he sees a man who doesn't have a wedding garment. Let me ask you, is this happening in heaven when everybody's in heaven? Is it the case that when everyone is in heaven, Jesus is going to come out He says, how'd you get in here? No. This is describing the investigative judgment, the believers are on earth, but the checking of the garments is taking place where? In heaven, on the basis of the records of each individual. 
And so in the church, you have those who have the wedding garment and those who don't. Do you have wheat and tares in the church? Absolutely. Do we have good and bad fish in the church? Absolutely. Do we have those in the church that say, Lord, Lord, they perform miracles and they give prophecies and they cast out demons and Jesus is going to say, and they do this in Christ's name, Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. They claim Jesus, but they were counterfeit believers. Are there individuals in the church that have a form of godliness, but don't have the power of godliness? Yes. Are there individuals in the church that are given talents and they don't use the talents for the glory of God? Absolutely, the parable of the talents, everyone who received talents claimed to be a follower of Jesus. Let me ask you, when a person is forgiven, can their forgiveness be revoked by God? You know, some people say, you know, th that's not possible. Once forgiven, always forgiven. No. Remember the parable of uh, two debtors? There was one debtor who owed a huge sum. He could never pay it. And so he was going to be cast into prison. And he cried out to his master. He says, oh, please give me time and I'll pay the debt. And he cried so hard that his master did something even better than giving him time to pay the debt. He actually said, your debt is forgiven. Go. You're free. Ho! Oh, he was jumping for joy because he didn't have to pay his debt because the master forgave the debt. He was forgiven, right? So then he goes out the door and he sees someone who owes him 100 denarii, which is about 100 days of work. The, the daily pay was one, denari one denarius. Could he have paid that debt? Could that person have paid that debt? Sure, in installments, right? But what did this guy do who had been, been forgiven a huge debt? He said to this guy, pay me what you owe me. And what did this guy say? He said, give me time, and I'll pay you. I'm not going to give you a second. He grabs him by the neck, and he's choking him. Well, it just so happens that the servants of the master were watching what was going on, and they went and told the master. By the way, those are the angels, the recording angels. <laughs> and they told the master what had happened with this guy. And the master said, bring him here. And you know the end of the story. His forgiveness was revoked. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, is what Jesus said. And he says, if you don't forgive, he will not forgive. So in the church, you have people who have embraced Jesus. They have been forgiven of their sins, but they're not sincere. Because that individual, he just wanted to not go to prison. He wasn't really sorry that he had incurred indebtedness. Now, like I mentioned, when I was a boy, my parents would go to the island of Margarita, which is one of the states in the country of Venezuela. It's an island state. And one of our favorite um, activities was to go to the shore where the fishermen came in. The name of the place was El Tirano. I don't know why they call it a tyrant. But anyway, we would go at 4 o'clock in the morning and would see the fishermen come in with their nets. And the boat was full of all kinds of different marine creatures. There were starfish, there were little sharks, there was uh, this fish that had looked like, kind of like a, a catfish, great big head and a very small body, and also the stickers that come out, so you have to be very careful with catfish because they have these stickers that come out and they'll sting you. All different kinds of marine creatures in the net. And when they got to the shore, they, would, they had baskets and they would put the good fish in one basket and everything that they were going to discard, they would put in another basket. And of course, the fish that were put in the basket to discard they didn't go to the marketplace, but the good fish were taken to the marketplace. 
Is the time coming when the fishing expedition is over? Yes. Is there a time coming when the separation is finished? Yes. Let me read you a few statements from the Spirit of Prophecy. Christ's Object Lessons, page 100 and not 23. There's a time coming when we're not going to throw out the net anymore. Because all of the fish that are going to be in the boat are already in the boat. The separation takes place. And the parable tells us that the good fish are taken to the marketplace. That basically means that we're taken to heaven. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, God, the, the wheat is taken to God's barn and the tares are burned. The good, that means the good fish are thrown away, the good fish are kept, and the bad fish are thrown away. Christ's Object Lessons 123. Again, these parables of the net and the wheat and tares teach that there is to be no probation after the judgment, after the separation. When the work of the gospel is completed, when we finish throwing the net, there immediately follows the separation between good and evil, and the destiny of each class is forever fixed. So in this parable, you have the investigative judgment and the end of preaching and the end of the investigative judgment. She also wrote, Christ's Object Lessons 122, when the mission of the gospel is completed, the judgment will accomplish the work of separation. On page 71, she wrote, Christ has plainly taught that those who persist in open sin must be separated from the church. But he has not committed to us the work of judging character and motive. The tares and the wheat are to grow together until the harvest. And the harvest is the end of probationary time. The harvest is not the second coming of Christ. The harvest is the close of probationary time because at that moment, the good and the bad fish have been separated. The wheat and the tares have been separated in the investigative judgment. So we have a lot to learn from fishing, don't we? There's much more than just, uh, you know, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, which is really important, but uh, fishing is an art. It has to be learned. We have to learn how to fish. Now let's go to the two miraculous fishing expeditions. There's one key point that I want us to notice in these two stories. Go with me to Luke chapter 5 and verses 1 through 11. Luke chapter 5 and verses 1 through 11. We're going to read the story. Uh, you know, fix in your mind the details of the story. Imagine that you're there because we're going to come back to some of those details. Luke 5, verse 1. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats. That's an important detail. Up to this point, he was not in the boat. So it says, then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, when they had done what? Let down the net at Christ's word. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, 
for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, at the moment of their greatest success, they forsook all and followed him. What a story. Now let's unpack the story, verse by verse. Let's go to verse 4. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, Peter reacted in an interesting way. He said, you know, we've been fishing all night and we have not fished anything. Maybe Peter thought, Jesus, you're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. Leave the fisher fishing to me. Now, this was happening in the daytime. Fishermen in Israel do not fish in the daytime because the fish can see the nets and they flee from the nets. And so, you know, Peter is saying, you know, first of all, we don't fish in the daytime. Furthermore, we didn't fish anything all night. What a strange request. The circumstances were prohibitive, in other words. Now let's go to chapter uh, 5 and verse 5, the first part of the verse. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. What does this teach us? Hard work does not guarantee success. Peter and his fellow laborers had labored all night. They'd worked hard and they fished nothing. Peter knew how to fish. He was a seasoned fisherman. He knew the right time to fish. He knew the best places to fish. He knew the best techniques to use. He had state-of-the-art equipment. However, the bottom line is that experience, knowledge, methods, and technology did not guarantee success. There was something missing. Remember that. Now let's go to the second half of verse 5. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, in other words, in obedience to your word, to cast the net, I will let it down. And when they had done this, when they had obeyed Christ's word to fish, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. Peter obeyed the command of Jesus to cast out the net as we are to obey the command of Jesus to preach the gospel, to cast out the net. It is not our role to attract the fish. That is the job of Jesus. It is our job to cast the net. And Jesus will attract the fish. If Peter had been disobedient to the command of Jesus, if he had not cast out the net, there would have been no fish. Now, this teaches another lesson. Notice verse 7. It tells us here that fishing is a cooperative effort between Christ and us. Ellen White wrote in Christ's Object Lessons, page 333, a statement that probably we're all acquainted with. As the will of man cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. What? As the will of man cooperates with the will of God and applies to fishing, to obeying Christ's command, it becomes omnipotent. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. All his biddings are enablings. He not only commands us to fish, but he says, if you obey my command, I will attract the fish. I will attract the souls. 
So soul winning is a cooperative effort between Christ and us. It is our role to preach, to teach, and cast out the net to give Bible studies, but it is the role of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit to attract the fish to the net. Some church members say, well, just pray that the souls will come into the church. Be nice, and the souls will come into the church. Folks, the fish do not jump into the boat. <laughs> the fish have to be brought into the boat. They have to be brought into the church. And it's interesting that Jesus did not pray primarily for more power. He prayed for more laborers. Remember in Matthew 9, 37 and 38, the power is there, folks. Jesus didn't have to pr pray for power, for a harvest. The power is there. He had to pray for harvesters. Us. Listen. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful. But what? But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest that he give you power to harvest. No, to send out laborers into his harvest. And the parable of the fish is pray that there will be more fishermen because the souls are out there just waiting for us to cast out the net. The divine power will attract the fish. But listen, fishing for souls is not only a cooperative effort, cooperative effort between Christ and us, divine power and human effort. It is also a cooperative effort between churches. There were two boats in this story. Successful fishing requires cooperation between pastor and pastor and church and church. You know, there's many, much rivalry among churches when it comes to soul winning. Every church wants to excel every other church in the number of fish that they get. There's enough fish to go around. There's enough fish to fill all of the boats. Every church. And all churches should work together. They should cooperate in the task of fishing. And then all of the boats will be full. Who gets the credit <laughs> in this story? I told you we were going to be practical tonight. This is not some, uh, you know, prophetic message, really. It's what we should be doing. You know, we shouldn't be warming the pews of the church. We should be working, working to win souls, praying that the Lord will give power to attract the fish so that we can win souls. Now, when Peter and the other disciples brought in enough fish for both boats, who did they give the credit to? Notice verses 8 through 10. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Peter was a boastful person. He didn't say, See all the fish that I caught? No. No. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the cast of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Success in fishing did not make Peter proud. It made him humble. He did not brag about how many fish he had been successful in getting into the boat. He couldn't take any of the credit. He knew that the power was found in Jesus. And therefore, he says, depart from me, for I am a sinful man. Sometimes we get all caught up in the numbers game. We brag about our pastor, our church, our conference, our union, our division, winning more souls than the others. 
This should lead us, success in fishing should lead us to see our own unworthiness and to give all of the glory and honor and praise to the Lord. Because if he did not attract the fish, we would cast the net in vain. Now here's another lesson. Notice verses 9, 10, 10 and 11. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now and on you will catch men. So, when they had brought their boats to land, let me ask you, if they'd taken the fish to the marketplace, would that be great, great financial gain? Yeah. But it says, when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. At the moment of their greatest prosperity, when they could have taken the fish to the market and made a big profit, they forsook all to fish men. All their occupations, activities, pastimes were subordinate to the task of fishing. They had launched out into the deep to fish for fish, and now they were to launch out into the deep to fish for men. They found the treasure, and they invested all to purchase the treasure. They found the pearl of great price, and they invested all to purchase the pearl of great price. Now, there's something very interesting that Jesus said to the disciples after this miraculous catch. He said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. He didn't say, follow me, and I will teach you how to fish. He did not say, follow me, and I will show you how to fish. He said, I will make you fishers of men, which means I will empower you to fish. Jesus not only commands us to fish and to follow his example in fishing, but he promises to empower us to fish when we come to him in prayer. Now, why was this fishing expedition successful? Let's go back to verse 3 of Luke chapter 5. Remember that he was teaching outside the boat when the disciples went out to fish. But when the disciples came to the shore, Jesus got into the boat what attracted the fish? The person who was in the boat. <laughs> the fish were called by their creator, if you please. It says in verse 3, Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the multitudes what? From the boat. Listen to this statement from Ellen White, Desire of Ages 249. During that sad night on the lake, when they were separated from Christ, the disciples were pressed hard by unbelief and weary with fruitless toil. However, his presence kindled their faith and brought them joy and success. What brought success? The presence of Jesus in the boat. And then she says, so it is with us. Apart from Christ, our work is fruitless, and it is easy to distrust and murmur. However, when he is near and we labor under his direction, we rejoice in the evidence of his power. It is Satan's work to discourage the soul. It is Christ's work to inspire with faith and hope. What attracted the fish? The presence of Jesus in the boat. What attracts people to the church? The presence of Jesus in the church. Attracts the fish. And then we cast the net and we fish a large amount of fish. Now let's go to the second uh, fishing expedition. Let's notice uh, this is in John chapter 21. After these things, Jesus showed himself, this is the beginning of the chapter, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. 
And in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. <laughs> this is a reaffirmation of the first story, because now they don't catch anything. Verse 4, but when the morning, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Where was Jesus that night of fishing? On the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat. <laughs> they were casting the net on the wrong side of the boat. Now, how is that important? Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Ellen White wrote in Desire of Ages, page 811, and Jesus had a purpose in bidding them cast their net on the right side of the ship. On that side, he stood upon the shore. What attracted the fish? Jesus! on the right side of the boat. That was the side of faith. If they labored in connection with Him, by His divine power, combining with their human effort, they could not fail of success. We all know the passage of John 12, where Jesus said, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. The fish were not attracted to the fishermen, or to the state-of-the-art boat, or to the upbeat programming on the boat. They were attracted to the one on the boat. You know, sometimes we think that we can do all kinds of gimmicks in church that will attract people to the church. Let's pray and ask Jesus to be in the church. And then we won't need all those gimmicks to try and attract, attract the unchurched. They'll see our love. They'll see our passion for their salvation. They'll see that Jesus is with us. And they will accept the message and end up in the boat. So do we want a full church? Do we want souls to be drawn to the boat? Let's not do it with continental breakfasts or with upbeat worship services or with remodeling our sanctuary. Nothing wrong with these things, by the way. Don't do it by meeting people's felt wants. I did say needs. People's felt wants. Make sure that Jesus is in the boat, in the church. Now let's just mention Peter as we draw this to a close. Peter, before the day of Pentecost, was a mess. Always speaking out of turn, always putting his tongue in fourth gear before he put his brain in first gear, putting his foot in his mouth, concerned about, you know, what's in it for us, all of them arguing about who was going to be the greatest, not able to cast out demons. Remember at the foot of the Mount of the Transfiguration? But on the day of Pentecost, Peter was a changed man. Just a month and a few days afterwards. Peter fulfilled what Jesus said to the disciples about fishing men and being successful. Let's notice. Who was the fisherman on the day of Pentecost? Peter. You read Acts chapter 2. Who preached the sermon? 
Peter preached a sermon. By the way, they had prayed in chapter 1 before. And they, made, they, they repaired the differences between one and the other. They were all of one accord when the day of Pentecost came because they had prayed intensely in chapter 1. Did Peter receive power? Yes, Jesus said, you shall receive power. Wait in Jerusalem, you shall receive power, and you shall be what? Witnesses for me. So Peter cast out the net of the gospel on the day of Pentecost. Was he successful in his fishing expedition? 3,000 fish. And what were the fish joined to? It says that they were joined to the church. He fished 3,000 souls, and they went into the boat, the church. What was the secret of the success of Peter and the apostles? Our scripture reading for this evening. Now, when they saw the boldness, don't be afraid to witness. Be nice, concise, and precise. Let's learn to fish with tact, but with boldness. So it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were uneducated. By the way, that word in Greek is agramatos. It means that, well, gramatos comes from gram. <laughs> in other words, they were uneducated. And the other word is very interesting. The word untrained is the word idiotes, where we get the word idiot from. That is in the estimation of the religious leaders. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. What attracted the fish? Jesus. And you know, on the day of Pentecost, Peter didn't even have to make a call. <laughs> After he finished his sermon, in chapter, 30, uh, chapter 2 and verses 37 and 38, there's a rush of those who are present to where Peter is. They say, what should we do? In the light of your sermon, what, what do we need to do? Peter says, repent and be baptized and you will receive the forgiveness of sin and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Imagine that. He didn't even have to, have to make a call because his message was so powerful, because it was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Folks, I trust that as we go home from this camp meeting, we will make it an intentional thing that we are going to find opportunities to witness boldly. It's not only through preaching. It's through teaching. It's through health education. It's through our educational system. There are many different ways of casting out the net not only preaching sermons. Just do it with, within your niche, your area of expertise. God wants us to use our profession, our job, as an opportunity to witness to others. And we'd be amazed at the growth of the Michigan Conference, not only in spirituality, but also numerically. As I end, I pray that this will be the experience of the Michigan Conference. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for these marvelous things that you recorded in your holy word. We ask, Lord, that you will empower all those who are here, all those who will hear this message, everyone, everywhere in the world who has come into the boat, I ask, Lord, that you will give us that passion to see the salvation of souls and that we will cast out the net with the assurance that Jesus will attract the fish and many will be saved in the kingdom. That's the passion of our life. This we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.